hello everyone. I'm glad everybody made to class tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about bees, uh, anatomy, and biology. So first off, most of you know, most of the bees in your colony are going to be worker bees. They uh, account for 90% of the bees in the colony during the summer, 100% in the winter. Drones, are about 10%, they are the male bees, the workers are female, drones are males, and we have one queen in each hive. The parts of the bee. First off, we have the head. On the head, the bee has five eyes. They have three simple eyes in the middle of their forehead, located here, two compound eyes. The compound eyes, detect color, movement, and different patterns. Bees also see in a different, differently than we do. They see more ultraviolet light and polarized light. So in the bees world, red looks black and they mainly see in green, blue, and ultraviolet. So they, they're further down the spectrum than we are. Green is also kind of black. So we have to remember when we're painting hives that some colors look very different to bees than we do. The three simple eyes are called oculi. They are used to detect sunlight, light intensity, and they help to na for navigation and orientation. One of the things that they kind of pick up on is if a, a bird or a cloud flies overhead makes the bees look around to see if they're gonna get eaten or if they have to dodge something. The antennas are on the head. And the antennas are very important for the bee. They are used for taste, smell, hearing, and touching. All the smells in the hive using pheromones are detected by the antenna. They don't hear like we hear, but they sense vibrations. We have to remember that the hive is always dark. So seeing in the hive is a little on the difficult side. So by sensing the vibrations is how the bees detect like the waggle dance. It's all, all sensed by vibration. If you ever watch a bee communicate or go up to one of its nest mates, the, the antenna are movable. They're movable and they bend. And they use this for touching. And by touching each other, they sense who each other are. They like to touch things with their antenna for their sensory. If a bee lands on you, the antennas are going like crazy. We also think that the antenna bends during flight to help determine airspeed. So when a bee's flying out has detected the waggle dance and they have to know how far to fly to the flowers that are out there. They need to know how fast they're flying and they, they have a, like a constant flying speed that they uh, try to use. So the antennas also detect uh, temperature. They're CO2 sensors. They're used for partly for compass and protracting. So they use, the antennas are very important for bees. On the lower part of the head, the bee has mandibles. And the mandibles act as our jaws and they are used to help shape wax after they're secreted. The bees secrete wax flakes and they use their mandibles to apply that flexible wax into the honeycomb. They also use it their jaws to not as much eating, but uh, carrying debris out of the hive, uh, rustling, they can chew on the mites. Some of our uh, new research is related to mite control. And we're learning that smaller mandibles have a better, tighter jaws and they're stronger. So they are able to crack our varroa mites so that they eventually die. In between the mandibles, they have a tongue, which is called a prosepus. And the tongue is like a straw and they use it to suck up the nectar and flowers. Their tongue is not very long. 
So bees primarily like small flat flowers because the length of their tongue down to the nectar. The, ne the reason flowers have nectar in them is to attract the bee to gather pollen to distribute to another flower. So the nectar is not really used any purpose in the flower except to attract bees or other pollinating insects. And all insects, the pollinators have different length of tongue. So let's say a bumblebee is bigger, its tongue is longer. Butterflies' tongues are even longer yet. Some of our bats also pollinate. So you can see everybody has something to do in the ecosystem and they're all a little different. From there, we move to the thorax, which is the middle part of the bee, as you can see here in the picture. In the thorax, the legs are attached, the wings are attached, and there's a stomach. The bee has two stomachs, and we'll go through the whole food digestion here since the honey stomach is kind of in between the thorax and the abdomen. And then we go into the abdomen, but the bees have a foregut, a midgut, and a hindgut. The foregut is called the crop or honey stomach. And this is where the honey nectar is gathered after the bees use their tongue to suck it up out of the flowers. Between the honey stomach foregut and the midgut, they have a proventriculatus, which is basically a shutoff valve. So when the bee is full of nectar, the valve is shut and will not allow other digested food to come back up into the stomach, the honey stomach, to contaminate the nectar. The, hind, the midgut is also called the ventriculatus, and that is where the food digestion takes place. So all the food is swallowed also, passes through the foregut into the midgut and digestion happens there. The hindgut is where the intestines and waste go through. After the hindgut, we have the rectum and the anus where excess food, undigested food is released. The bees also have malfingian tubes that act as kidneys. They are in the abdomen also. So this is how they get rid of their water waste. The bees have four wings, two fore wings and two smaller hind wings. Bees can fly approximately 12 to 20 miles an hour. So if you ever think you can outrun a bee, think again, because I know I cannot come anywhere close to 12 mile an hour. The bees can unhook their wings. So when, they fl when they're flying, the wings are hooked together and, and act as one unit. When they're in the hive in the winter time, like right now, they unhook the wings so they're not able to fly. They don't move very much air, but the wing muscles are the largest muscles in the bee. So how the bees keep warm in the winter time is they vibrate their muscles kind of like us shivering which generates heat which keeps them warm and by doing by unhooking their wings it allows so they're not using too much they're not moving very much air in the hive but they're huddled together to stay warm it's pretty cold out right now and a lot of people always are interested in how bees stay warm. And what bees do is they gather in a big cluster. So the bees are in a big ball, the queen is in the middle and the bees are vibrating their wing muscles to stay warm. When they're not raising brood, the temperature of the hive is, or the temperature of the cluster is approximately 70 degrees. After the queen starts laying eggs after the first of the year, the center of the ball will be more like 92 degrees because that's optimal temperature to raise brood in. In this ball, they the bees slowly rotate. So the bees on the outside work in where it's warmer and the bees on the outside are the coldest bees. 
also the bees are clustered and they eat honey. Honey's their energy they use to their food to generate energy. So the bees on the outside are eating some honey and they pass it mouth to mouth trophylactically to the other bees in the, in the cluster. So the bees are constantly eating honey. They're generating heat. They do not heat their whole hive. They're basically just heating the ball of bees inside the hive. So that's things that we have to think about when we're insulating hives, when we're getting ready for winter. As they generate heat, heat, hot air mixes with cold air. We get condensation, so we need, the way we've got our hives designed, we need some ventilation to help get rid of that warm, moist air so it does not freeze on the lid or on the inner cover. And once it warms up in the spring, the, all this frost starts to melt and falls down on the bees and wet bees are dead bees. Bees can take a lot of cold weather so it's, it's amazing what they can do. The bees also have six legs that are attached to the thorax. The hind leg is probably the most important leg. We notice that leg the most because that's where the pollen baskets are on. These are long hairs that are on the leg of the bee that the bee attaches all the pollen to. So when the bees out rolling around in these flowers gathering nectar. They also can be out there just gathering pollen and pollen is their protein source. So the bees really need this. They get the pollen all over their body and eventually the bee will stop, use its tongue to move, lick up this pollen all over her body. She's also covered with hairs. Her whole body's covered with air, hairs, including her eyes. So she gathers this pollen that's stuck on her body. She puts it on her back legs so she can fly back to the hive and release it into the hive. The abdomen is the rear part of the bee. In the, in the abdomen, we have the gangula which is the nervous system, which runs from the head all the way to the tail. We have the stinger. The bee has a heart. It's not quite like our heart, but it circulates their blood. The blood is called hemolymph. Blood circulatory system is also not like ours. The blood is not in, vessel, in veins like ours, but it's just a pool of blood, the whole body's filled with blood, the heart pumps the blood, circulates it around. They have spherical tubes along their abdomen, which are basically their lungs. Up in this area, there's a row of tubes and air moves in, the blood runs around the tubes to get oxygen and they expel carbon dioxide that way. So their abdomen is where they breathe. This whole line of tubes. The blood circulates as one big system. Their stinger is in the abdomen with the stinger apparatus. So when a bee, a worker bee stings you, what happens is the stinger has a barb on it and it sticks the barb and stinger in your finger. When the bee pulls away, this whole stinger apparatus, muscles, the venom sac, the whole thing come out of the back of the bee and stay in your stinger. The muscles pulsate more venom into your finger to make it sore and sore all the time. What happens is now this bee has a big gaping hole in here and since the vein blood is just circulating through here, it basically bleeds to death. That's how a bee dies after stinging you is it basically bleeds to death because the blood comes out because there's nothing to stop it. The sooner you get the stinger out of your finger or leg or wherever you get stung, the quick, the less pain you'll have, the quicker your 
the, and quicker is better. You need a sharp instrument like a hive tool is very good at scraping along that stinger and it will release from your finger and won't hurt quite as bad. Drones do not have stingers, so you don't have to worry about getting stung by the male bees. The queen does have a stinger in her abdomen. It does not have a barb on it, so she can sting you or sting her competition, really, to sting them, kill them without killing herself. These are the parts of the bee. Here's a picture of, of the bee's tongue or prosepus. You can see here, pollen sac on the back of the bee, and you can see all the hairs on the bee. The hairs are have static electricity to them. So when the bee flies around, there's a little static electricity that helps get the pollen to stick to their body and she moves it back to her back. All the bees in the hive have different stages and pupation length and larva length. As you can see here, the worker, all the eggs are an egg for three days. The larva starts to change, a worker is six days, a drone six and a half, and a queen is five and a half. And workers are 12 days as a pupae, drones are 14 and a half, and a queen is seven and a half. So from a queen bee, from the time her egg is laid to she emerges is 16 days. And the queen emerges from a cell like this. This is called a queen cell. And you can see it's much larger than the worker cells around it. And workers will emerge from cells like this where a queen emerges from this. The queen emerges as a queen. She's, she's born into the hierarchy. The worker bees decide who gets to be the queen by what they feed it. And they will raise many, many queens when they need a queen. They, they just don't raise one, but they raise many of them. So here you can see a picture with two queen cells on the bottom of a, of a frame. And the queen emerges out of the bottom of the cell, kind of like the worker bees emerge out of the top of the cell, but she chews her way out. She uh, chews along this edge, trap door opens, she crawls out. And once she crawls out, she, uh, she tries to kill her competition, but she spends about a week in the hive, primarily getting her wings a little stronger. When she first hatches, her wings are very soft and she cannot fly, she can only walk. So she needs a few days to age, usually around a week to 10 days. And on a nice warm day with the sun shining, mid afternoon, she goes on a mating flight. And during this mating flight, she flies away from the hive and she finds a drone conjugation area or a DCA. And this is kind of like the singles bar where all the drones hang out waiting for a virgin queen to fly through. When the queen flies through, she has many suitors and the more suitors, the better because this way we have biodiversity in our hives. She, we, we need more than just one drone because then we have a very, very narrow lineage. So if she has many, many drones that she mates with, we have better diversity. So she takes the mating flight, maybe this could happen in one day or several days where she flies out in the afternoon and gets mated. Once she returns back to her other hive after being mated this one time or several times, the only other time the queen will ever leave the hive is during swarming. So the queen only leaves the hive for two reasons, mating and swarming. So she comes back and she turns in, this is during mating, the bees mate about a hundred feet in the air. When she flies through, it's very quick. The drones will die after mating, but the queen stores all the semen that she gets from her many mating flights in her spermacatha. This is a picture of a queen bee. It's probably a mated queen bee because once she mates, she matures for a couple more days before she starts laying eggs and her abdomen 
usually gets a lot longer. So when she first emerges, she's a smaller bee. After a while, she becomes rather large and difficult for her to fly. Here's another picture of a queen bee walking around. And you can tell her offspring are different color. So you can see in this hive with the uh, different drones that she is mated with. She's got some yellower bees and some darker bees. Here's a darker bee. You also, here's a drone. You can see he's a little bit larger than the worker bees. Another picture of a queen. And they call her this her retinue. And these are the bees that take care of her. The queen's main job is just to lay eggs. She lays up to 2,000 eggs a day during spring season when the colonies are building up after winter. So they have a huge workforce to gather honey, their food, to get them through winter. So these bees tend to the queen's needs. They feed her. This bee up here may be feeding her. They're touching her, sensing her. They're using their antennae. Uh, they clean up after her. They take care of all of her needs. Here's the abdomen of a queen bee, the reproductive system. They have ovaries, two ovaries, and lots of overalls inside where all the eggs are developed. She releases an egg down the duck. It comes by the spermacatha where all the semen is stored. When the egg passes through and she's gonna lay a worker egg, which is a fertilized egg, she releases several sperm with it to fertilize that egg. So every time an egg comes by, she lets a little sperm go and she stores all the semen from her several mating flights over a couple day period in her life for the rest of her life. So a lot of times if she's poorly mated, she doesn't get enough sperm. She will have a very short lifespan because the other bees, the worker bees sense that she starts to run out of eggs. She's not laying enough. They will raise another queen and they will kill the original queen. Here again is a frame of bees, lots of worker bees, different colors. Here's a big drone. And here's the queen bee down here. She also gives off pheromones. The pheromones, one of the pheromones in the hive is to suppress the workers from their ovaries being developed. These, these are female worker bees. So they do have ovaries, only the pheromones suppress them so they will not lay eggs. If a, if a hive goes queenless long enough, there is not enough pheromones in there to suppress their ovaries. They will start laying eggs. To, they're, they're in their attempt to survive and not fail. But the problem is they have not mated. So all they do is lay drone eggs. And the queen will lay eggs in the center of the cell where worker bees are shorter. And their eggs tend to be on the side walls, not in the center because they cannot reach the center of the, of the cell. And they also lay multiple eggs in cells where a queen only lays one egg in each cell. Up here, you can see a couple eggs. There's a couple eggs in these cells. There's an egg, a couple eggs there, the little white hair in the center. Again, the queen can lay fertilized eggs or unfertilized eggs that become drones. So any any egg, fertilized egg that the queen lays has the potential to be a queen. So every worker in that hive at one time within the first few hours after hatching as an egg into a larvae, they had the potential to be a queen. Eggs are a little more, are a little straighter than these other ones. She lays an egg that's straight up and down and just before it hatches, it starts to tip over a little bit and curl. So these are a little bit older, they're getting ready to hatch. The size of this larvae here, I'm gonna say is a freshly hatched larvae. 
and it's a larvae for six days. So there's almost a six day window here. So day one, day two, day three, four, five, and these are pretty much like a six day old larvae. You can see it's filling the whole cell. It, and then they, it will spin a cocoon and here it's capped over. And under the cap, the worker bees put the cap on, but underneath that capping, it starts to pupate. So when I am inspecting a hive, I look for eggs and small larvae. If I have not been in that hive for seven or eight, 10 days, I know it's a egg for three days and a larvae for six. I know when I find eggs or small larvae that three or four days ago, I had a queen laying in there. And you want this brood to be nice and pearly white and shiny like these. Here's another, here's another frame of larvae. With the dimples along here, I'm going to say it's going to be, this is all drone brood. Drones are bigger than worker bees, so they need a little bit bigger cell to come out of, and they end up with this dome, or this whole frame will look like it's a cobblestone. If it's worker brood, it'll be really nice and flat and smooth, but drones have these bumps because they're, they need a bigger area. But you want this larvae to be nice and pearly white. Here is what pupating larvae look like. They, it takes 12 days to pupate. So it's an egg for three, a larvae for six, and it pupates for 12 for a total of 21 days. So about every two days, you can look at these different larvae and just imagine two days, two days, two days, and we get to 12. This stage here is called pink eye, and you can see how the eyes of the bees are pink. This, this is called purple eye. So if you're reading online or in a book and you hear pink eye or purple eye, they're talking about different stages in, during pupation. Here's a frame of worker brood. You can see how all this brood is nice and smooth. You, we really look for a, a good queen will fill every hole, but sometimes they do miss a hole. This is not a big deal if you just have some sporadic holes. There could have been something wrong with that larvae and the bees sensed it and removed it. And, and by removing that, they get rid of whatever was wrong with that. If it was diseased or maybe it had a mite on it. In the early spring also, they'll leave some holes here like this and a worker bee will get in here and vibrate to generate heat to help keep the brood in this area warm. So if you put, we call these heater bees. So if you put a bee in each one of these holes, it will generate some heat and keep the brood in that area warm besides the bees covering the outside of it and vibrating their muscles to keep generate heat to keep the brood area approximately 92 degrees. So this is always about 90 degrees little over 90. Here's a patch of worker brood and this is drone brood. You can see the difference. See the cobblestone looking, the very smooth looking. It's usually a little bit on the brown side. This is a mix of wax that the worker bees put over so the pupation goes on underneath. Again, worker brood, drone brood. A lot of frames, especially with uh, natural foundation, the bottom row doesn't quite line up. So you get some deviation and the bees like to put drone brood down here. Remember when we're putting foundation in a hive, it's 100% worker brood, but the bees want 10 to 15% drone, especially in the spring when swarming season's coming up. So they need they need drones. So this is what, how the bees compensate for that. Another frame, a lot of times they run out of room. And here you can see 
they hung the drone brood on the bottom wooden part of the frame. So the bottom board of the frame here is covered with drone brood due to the fact the bees are just trying to cram worker brood, worker brood up here, drone brood down here. And the queen is on this picture. She's hiding a little bit. I'll give you a little bit of time to look for her. See if you can find the queen on here. This is the queen. She's right here. She's probably laying eggs in each one of these cells. She's probably taking a break because you can see quite a few bees circling her and looking at her. Again, a lot of times, especially in the spring, we'll get this dome look. And this dome look is very, very good. We, we like to see this this dome look. So the queen started laying eggs here and she just keeps building the dome bigger, bigger and bigger every day. So you got cap worker brood here. I can see some larvae out here. See right here, you can see the white. So there's larvae. The queen's probably laying eggs out in this area. This is cap honey. And Ideally, we like to have a band of pollen along here. Pollen's their protein source. And they mix that to feed the baby bee. So they like to keep all their food real close. so They don't have to travel several frames to feed the bees. But this is very, very, this is what you see a lot with the honey up here in the corners and a brood as a big dome or a circle. Here is a frame that is, one, it's plastic without the added wax that I always talk about, how I like to put wax on here. So the first things that went wrong here is the bees did not attach a lot of this area to the frame. It's just kind of tacked. Every once in a while, there's just a little bit of wax holding it in. But this, this is like a two-sided, or two-sided wax so the queen can hide underneath here. You would not be able to find her. It's easier to damage her. The frames don't fit together correctly. You can see drone brood here. See the big caps? But this is a very poor pattern. See how it's not full. It's just kind of a hit and miss. There is some worker brood down here in this corner, but there's also some drones here. And these are queen cells hanging. One, two, three, four, and five. So there's five queen cells on this frame. So like I said, when the queen sense there's something going on, they will raise many, many queens at the same time to kind of hedge their bets. Maybe one of these won't materialize, it won't develop correctly, so it won't hatch. This picture was taken in a hive that was superseding its queen. You can see with this poor brood pattern, there was things going on. The bees sensed that and they decided they're gonna raise a new queen. So this is, these are some queen cells. Ideally, if I was inspecting this hive, I would take a couple of these queen cells out and leave probably the two best ones in this hive for them to raise. That way there's not as much fighting going on. Cause let's say this queen is the first one to hatch. She will come out and she will try to kill her competition sisters here. And one way she does that is she will chew a little hole in the side of this cell and sting that queen in there. Well, what goes on a lot in a hive is all these queens were started at approximately the same time. So they all hatch at the same time, maybe within minutes or hours of each other. So let's say two or three of these hatch before the initial queen killed them. So now they fight amongst each other. They will fight right out here on the combs and what they try to do is sting each other. They're biting each other. And what can happen is 
maybe the queen that won the battle didn't die, but now she's got a damaged wing and she cannot fly to leave the hive to mate. So we try to limit, at this point, I know the bees need a new queen. There's probably not even a queen in here at this point. I will leave two cells and leave the bees to fight it out amongst themselves. I always leave two in case there is something wrong with one of these and I can't tell it. This is a picture of a worker, newly hatched worker bee that has emerged. The way I know this is see how palish white, light gray color that this bee is. When they first come out, they look like a bee. They are just a little bit smaller. They are whiter and they look very hairy because there's lots of hair on here. And after a few days, some of these hairs wear off, especially up here in the thorax and the top of the abdomen, they seem to wear off. But a, the, this bee chews its way out. This cell here has got a mark here. I'm going to guess that this mark is where this baby bee underneath this cell is starting to chew its way out. So they chew this cap out and you see the first thing you see is antennas coming out of the seam where they're cutting. And then pretty soon this cap acts as like a flap and the flap starts moving. And if the bee can't push out, it chews a little more and then tries again. Another thing that's unique about worker bees is when they first hatch, one, they cannot fly, and two, they do not sting. So when you see a little bee, worker bee, freshly hatched bees on a frame, they will not sting you and they cannot fly. I've been known to drop a frame of bees in my life and I feel really bad when there's baby bees on there because I know they cannot fly back to the hive. So I've been known to spend many a minute, 15, 20, picking up newly hatched bees that cannot fly, put them back in the hive, but they, I know they will not sting me. The bees have different tasks as they get older. The average worker bee in a hive only lives for six weeks, so approximately 42 to 45 days. The first three weeks are spent inside the hive working. The last three weeks are outside the hive working. And they, they do to have a division of uh, labor. And as the bee, every couple days, their jobs change. So you can see on this chart, the first thing to do is clean and polish cells so the queen can lay eggs. Then they start caring for larger brood, feeding them. They eventually go to younger brood. They make royal jelly, feed the queen. Uh, there's a few days in there where they're good wax builders. So they secrete the wax. Some of the last jobs inside the hive are is guarding and cooling. From there, they progress into being forager bees. So they forage for nectar, pollen, and water. They also will gather propolis on trees. It's the last three weeks of their life that is very dangerous. Once a bee leaves the hive, it's a lot more dangerous outside the hive than inside the hive. So the, basically the bee will live for six weeks and they basically work themselves to death. A lot of, sometimes you'll see pictures of bees wings and there's only half a wing left. And that's because they've flown so much that it just wears their, their wings down. You can see here where this bee has a giant sack of pollen on its pollen baskets. This is where they carry the pollen that comes back in the hive. It's very easy to see a bee coming in with a load of pollen. Pollen comes in about every color under the rainbow. You see that one was orange, this one's yellow. And this is different colors of pollen that I collected from one of my hives one year. So same hive, different times of year. So this is very orange and yellow. This has got a lot of brown with the yellow. So the yellow is probably still in bloom, but the orange quit blooming. And we now have a flower producing yellow or brown and black 
pollen. Here's a frame of bees, brand new wax. The reason I know it's brand new wax is it's pretty white. Bees, when they secrete wax, it starts out as being white. And as the bees gather pollen and walk on it with pollen on their feet, it grinds us into the wax, it turns it darker. And when the baby bee emerges, it leaves a cocoon behind. That cocoon is also brown and starts to make the wax look yellow to brown to black. Eventually old wax will be coal black. But in this picture, what I see going on here is, is there's a big open area here. There's nothing going on in these cells. They look empty. And then the bees are putting pollen here. So the worker bees that are out foraging for pollen are coming back and the bee that brings the pollen in has to put it in the cells by herself. So she comes in, she backs into that and she uses her legs to kick that pollen off. She gets the pollen off in little pellets like here is looks like just a single pellet. This one maybe has two pellets in there and they push this pollen to the back of the cell. So they'll put some more in and like this one here, they they use their heads and they headbutt this to the back of the cell and they keep packing it in. And a lot of times you'll see like there'll be a layer of orange. If you take a cross section here of this pollen tablet, you'll see some orange, some yellow, some red, all mixed together. So different bees come in at different times of the day and they keep headbutting this. And it's kind of loose, if you would pick up one of these frames out of the hive to inspect it and tip it upside down, a lot of the po little pollen balls will fall out. But the bees are gathering this. Up here, you can see some shiny gooey substance and this is nectar being converted to honey. So again, we're seeing our dome. We have open cells down here. We got a band of pollen coming in here and then we have honey. And as an experienced beekeeper, I'm gonna guess that the queen's getting ready to lay eggs right in this area. That's why the bees are keeping it open for the queen to lay eggs in here. So they're, they're putting their food close to where they want the queen to lay eggs. Here again is, is a frame with lots of pollen when there's lots of pollen to gather, they just keep gathering and gathering. Sometimes you have whole frames full of pollen. Eventually this could be an issue because when this is full of pollen, it limits the bees, the, especially the queen space to where she wants to lay eggs. They can always put nectar up in the honey super, but they cannot put, use this for laying eggs. So. You can see the last of these larvae are hatching along here. There's just a little bit of cat brood. So as fast as it's hatching, the bees are putting pollen in here. They also during swarm season, they will fill these with nectar really quick to limit the queen space to lay eggs in their preparation to get her to fly again they need to slim her down a little bit. And when she's laying lots of eggs, her abdomen's really long and heavy and she cannot fly very well. Here's a frame with honey in it. You can see the shiny glistening. So when you inspect a hive, when you're, especially when you're beginning, you will see some shiny substance in it. That is nectar drying into honey, maybe it's honey already. Nectar when it's first put in is pretty thin and runny. And if you tip this frame upside down and shake it at all, the really thin nectar will run out where honey, once it gets to 18% moisture is thick and does not shake easily out of these cells. If you see different colors of a dollar color, that is pollen that they're storing in these cells. Eventually the bees turn their raw, fresh 
pollen into bee bread. And the way they do that is they mix some honey with it and it ferments a little bit with this little bit of honey. And this is called bee bread. And you can see this area in this section of this frame is covered with bee bread. You can also see cells with just plain honey in it. So they, they got an assortment of bee bread and honey on this frame. But this is, this is how they consume it. They, cons they do not consume raw, fresh pollen, but they consume it in this bee bread setup. Here's another frame. We're just looking at different frames. This, this hive has something going on because again, we have drone brood here, but we also have a big patch of capped honey. So this is all capped honey. You notice there isn't very many bees on it. My guess is they, this hive was smoked before they took this picture and the bees are feeding on the open nectar. So when you smoke your hive, the bees immediately start licking up the honey and they go to the open honey first. If this was winter time, they will chew this wax off eventually to get to the honey underneath. But when you smoke your hive, they, uh, the bees really go for that open nectar. Drones. Drones are the male bee of the hive. There's only like 10% in the hive in the summertime. In the wintertime, there are no drones in the hive. One way you can tell a drone from the other bees, one, it's bigger. And a lot of new beekeepers confuse drones with queens. The drone's eyes on the front of its head, the compound eyes are almost as big as the head. So that's one way. Two, their abdomens aren't as long and they're kind of bullet shaped versus having a long abdomen on the back of the bee. And drones take longer to emerge, primarily the two and a half extra days as a pupae. This is part of the reason that we get rid of some drones. We have some IPMs, integrated pest management. The varroa mite, our number one pest in bees, primarily like to raise their young in drone brood because they need these extra two days. If the varroa mites only raise in babies in worker brood, they only can maybe get one, maybe two offspring. But in a drone brood, these two extra days, they can go from two to maybe four or five. And that's where the hive can be overrun by the mites because they're way overpopulating now. So they primarily like drone brood. And the main thing that, the only thing that a drone does is mate with the queen. So the bees mate in the air primarily away from the original hive. So the new virgin queen will fly around a mile away from the hive to find some drones from different hives to mate with. We do not want the queen mating with brothers of herself. So she flies away. Drones being as big as they are can only fly in the air for about 15 minutes. So as far away from the home as they get or their hive, is about a quarter to a half mile where the queen can fly up to a mile away. So the drones fly out of the hive, hang out at the singles bar as a, in a drone conjugation area, and they hang out waiting for a virgin queen to fly through. If they spend about 15, 20 minutes out in the drone conjugation area and nobody comes through, they gotta come back to the hive to refuel. They do not feed themselves. The worker bees will feed them and they'll fly out again in hopes to get lucky. In the winter time, the worker bees sense that, hey, this is all the food we have. We need to, we need to ration it and you guys aren't doing anything. We, don't, we aren't made, raising any queens. We don't need queens mated. So we're gonna get rid of you. So in the, Later part of the fall, the worker bees rustle the male bees out of the hive 
and leave them to die outside the hive. So in the winter time, it's all females in there. Keeping warm, trying to keep alive till spring where they will raise more bees. Here again, you can see the difference in queen bees, drones, and worker bees. They're different sizes. 